in one day. Now, Sister White says the play is not universal for everybody with white time. So I believe, and I don't preach this, but I believe, and I feel comfortable saying this, that the first day is going to fall upon those that worship the peace of the and receive his mark and agree the soul. I believe the first day is going to hit America like wildfire. It's not necessarily going to be all around the world, but the impact. Sky News, BBC World News, everybody's going to hear that everybody's got some grievous sore and they can't go to the doctor because the doctors have it as well. Yeah. Hmm. And then one might get the waters of blood. The drinking water is blood. So these plagues are going to hit and then at the seventh plague at the voice of God is the partial resurrection. Now I'm going through the sequences with my sister at the back. I'm going into sequence just for you, all right? Now, at the voice of the seventh angel and the seventh plague, God says, it is done. There's an earthquake. And when there's an earthquake, there is a partial resurrection. And guess who sees the partial resurrection? The 144,000. And then the partial resurrection, technically, is for those who died by the faith of the third angel's message. Then, that sequence keeps on coming, and the horn of nature turns out of its course. Islands are being disappeared. You know, there's actually a certain country where there's no people who's going to be saved. And the whole island is just going to sink on the water. We're an island. There's certain places where there's nobody who loves the Lord. And those places are going to sink. But for those places that have the love of God, in a human being burning in their heart. When Jesus comes, then the 144,000 and the partial resurrected saints and the wicked, they will see Jesus coming. And when Jesus comes, they will say, Lord, this is our God, we are waiting for And then Jesus pivots in me, but he's not going to walk on earth. You know that. All right, good. Who's going to be walking on earth? Satan will impersonate, not impersonate, he's going to impersonate. Impersonate is when you carry on as though uh, you're only pretending to be that person. When you impersonate, that means you're telling everybody you are that person. So you're trying to impersonate with deception. And then technically when Jesus comes to the clouds, he calls the sleeping saints on the grave, and that is the worldwide first resurrection system. Alright? And then technically what to you. And then when they come up from their grave, the angel picks them and hoists them up into the chariot. And then we change that twinkling on our eye, and then we're hoisted up into the chariot, and then we're forever on our way to Puban and on seven days to journey. And I told you already, the reason why we're taking seven days is because there's some people in the first resurrection, not the Pasha, the first resurrection, they never kept the Sabbath holy. And they have to keep us out of the because the Bible says, Blessed they are his commandments, that they have the right to the tree of life. The tree of life will reject you, not keep God's commandments.
you know, it's only going to be like a couple of days. Like it's not like a whole couple of months and they're walking around and they're going to test. They're not doing nothing. Then. They're not doing nothing like that. They're just going to be there and they're going to be waiting. Because remember, the whole earth is going to be out of sync. You know, nature's going to be turned out of its course. Remember that the stream ceases to flow. And everything like that. From, I go to school to an Adventist school, and the first thing the Adventist message I've, I've ever heard this. And, you know, and I'm saying to myself, if, if I'm going to tell somebody about this, I can just go and tell somebody about this and look at him. Because this is really a deep thing. It is deep. This person would have to come into the church first yes. so you can, you can yes. tell this person this thing. Because I was saying to my daughter when I get home, and she gets home from church, and we were puzzled. Because I was saying, oh, she heard the lecture. I'm going to be 63 and I've never heard of the resurrection. So it's really, really puzzling me. I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I'm just giving my opinion. No, but I've proven that I'm right, though. Not to me, to be honest. Because it's true. I'm not going to sit here, I'm not going to sit here on the Sabbath and say this. It's not to me. It's not true to me. Because, to be honest, it's kind of really weird. Because if people go up on going to be resurrected in a partial resurrection, and then you're going to have the first resurrection when the dead in Christ shall rise, when the trump of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise in that first resurrection, that goes to show that the people who are partially resurrected will be, will, be, will be here then, which is saying that they They will be here with the people who are going to rise in the first resurrection. And to me, I do not really agree, because I do not understand. Uh, you know what? I, I, I've never I've never really known it to be a real problem amongst God's people. I thought it was Can we just listen um, to people in the first Yeah, I thought it was common knowledge. My sister. I think that's kind of wrong what you say. It's not common knowledge, obviously, you don't know. Um, there are things in the Bible, the text that says we shouldn't spend our time um, debating and, and arguing about points that is not pertaining to our own salvation. Because, you know, some things is just not, it's not going to make me go to heaven when I know them. Well, you might think not, I don't know. But this topic that you're saying, there's a lot of us here, if we're honest, never heard of it before. Probably need to study it more. We're not saying you're wrong, we're saying you're right, but we need to study it more. And if you came here to give us a program, Maybe if we spend all our time talking about that, that, unless that's what you wanted to talk about, if you spend all our time talking about that, we may miss the rest of what you've Now you can listen. I just wanted to deal with some issues because I think when I spoke about it today, yeah. you don't look to me. And it's a yeah. first group of people who kind of look to me as so, though, you know, like, where yeah. is coming from? So I'm not saying anything more than wanting to kind of. Yeah. Just highlight why I said what I said this morning. Because in the in, in preparation for the welcome table, I I, I kind of um, I kind of um, went through the events up to the second coming, and the partial resurrection is important. Okay, because can I can I ask you to favor then? Yes. Because we probably do need to. I mean, I'm I'm going to ask that myself, but I think we do need to actually understand it a little bit more. Because it sounds it sounds right because you know. The, I have read that it does say that those who peace are going to wake up and see So to say other people will wake up, it's not, it's not kind of a strange thing to say. It's just that at the moment we don't kind of yeah, understand. Okay. Even if we spend the rest of the evening going through little by little by little that we understand it, or we set it aside for Bible study. Yeah, I don't mind coming down. If Jenny invites me to come down to see Bible study in Judah, I'll come down to Jenny. More than welcome. And I'll make sure I deal with a couple other things as well. Now, if you don't understand that, the things I'm going to go through in a minute, you're not going to really, really get serious with me. All right, anyway. This one. Oh, okay. Is this, is it? Oh, okay, sister. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if you've touched on that before, but you know, I mean, I agree with both, because I'm not that old, but I was raised with Jen Mellon and Arthur. And also, you know, the, the group of people, it's the, the part of the world. 
And the reason why we know that it's from those who died from 1844, because Revelation 14, verse 12, 13, Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are they that die in the Lord. Not blessed are they that die. You have to die in the Lord, then you're blessed. And then your works does follow you. So I, I'm sorry that you haven't heard it before. It's not my fault. I've been preaching it for a good. I've been preaching now since 1990. And what we're in, we're in 25 years I've been preaching that. So I don't know why you haven't heard it. But it is not something which is strange. It's actually, it's actually in the great controversy. It's in, it's in, it's in actually, I think it's in the 27 fundamentals of the first, first and second res in the resurrection, you know? So check it out. Check it out and see where it goes. All right. Um, what else did I say? Ah, there was another one today. When I said about tithing. I noticed when I mentioned the tithing issue, I mentioned a time issue, and I felt we got spiritually stern. Well, I felt like we were. I felt like a woman from this part. Now, the time is 10%. That belongs to God. It's not yours. That 10% belongs to God. Now, you do what you want. What do you want to do on gross or net? That's up to you. But does God really need time? He said the pattern of a thousand years are his. God owns everything. So what is the time for? God. It is to make sure we don't become too covetous. But the time don't bring no blessing. And I told the people last week as well. The tithe don't bring no blessing. It belongs to the Lord because your breathing is here, is oxygen. It's God who gives you grace every morning. His grace is you every single morning. God wakes us up every morning. God said, listen, you give me 10% of your money because you know what? I am the one who's keeping you alive. You know where the blessings come? Sister, let me tell you something. If, well, all right, I'll, show you, I'll show you why I would say that. I know what you're saying, sister. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying because I intend on this. How much does the Jews bring back to the Lord? How much does the Jews pay? Saying that when you throw your tithe, nothing will happen. But if you really want to see the blessings of the Lord, 
you do the free will offering from a heart that says, Lord, I love you and I thank you for what you've done for me. Here's another 10%. I don't need to give it, I give it because you are God. Amen. And then all of a sudden, my finances start to be okay. You know why? Because the devourer could not get in. Now, if you feel 10% is good enough for you, that is all right. But let me ask you a question. The tithing is a principle. Tithing offering is not a feel factor. It's a principle. If you do it, I don't know not just come to church. The man says to me, listen, young man, when I come to church, I don't care how much money I have. I give God my tithe and my offering first. You don't say you pay, you pay this or pay that and see what's left. It's not, you don't see what's left in business. The Lord is in the first fruits. So you know what? Some people say, oh, I want this to pay. I want that. No, no, you don't worry about your bills. You worry about making sure there's nothing between your soul and your Savior. Because my God said, you know what? You can carry on the way you carry on, but I will blow on your money if you're not careful. Yes. And if not only that, I'll put holes in the back. That's right. So when you're trying to grab all your money, you say, no, I, 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 I want this to pay. You don't blow on it, or you cut a hole in it, and it will drop out before you know it. You won't even have no money. There's a time when I test the Lord, I test the Lord. But I said, Lord, I'm going to pay you first. And you know I didn't have the money to pay what I need to pay, you know? But all of a sudden, the Lord starts working in different ways. And before you know it, you pay the Lord, and you pay what you need to pay, and you still have money left for you. Don't try and catch God's blessings with your fist. Catch it with your hands open. Let him take what he wants, and let him put in your hand. What he wants. Now, I know there's a lot of young people. You don't pay tithe. Because you feel you have worked. What you think? You think the Lord needs your money? The Lord wants to work in you, young people. He wants you to make a covenant by sacrifice. And I know some of my cousins, I know you might be saying, Why are you too hard, preacher? Leave the young people alone. Let me tell you something. If the young people ever get serious with the Lord, the work will finish even quicker. I'm getting old and worn out now. You know, I'm soon in 50. I'm so, I run around like I'm in the 20s or 30s. Oh, man. The young people need to get serious for the Lord. And when I hear young people, all I hear about from, from the young people is, oh, I need this and I need that education. I need to get this big job. I don't hear nothing about them being in that for the Lord of heaven. And God needs some young people who are serious. Or oh, we're going to be here for years and years. I'll die off from lying in the rain. What are you doing for the Lord? My sister. Oh, my dear, I don't do that. You know, yes, you get those from folks. See, what the problem is that we don't. We don't think offering is important, you see. That's why I place emphasis. Any emphasis. A lot of people don't think offering is important. Offering is important. The Bible says we want to tie into the storehouse. Tie to offering. Offering is free will. And since I start paying 20%, the Lord has rebuked the power and there's so many blessings flowing into my life. And let me just throw this in as well. The Lord doesn't just pray with money. He might give you help, sister. And if you're a young lady or a young, young man and you need a little wife, you throw a good offering, the Lord might bless you with somebody. And let me tell you something that I said last week. When the Lord opened up a window of heaven for you, now you not throw down no no Jezebel here. No Jezebel ain't going to jump out of the window for you. Here I am. So yeah, so I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm telling you now, some of you don't throw offering, start throw offering, and I'm not saying you have to throw 10% like me, but give God something back from a free will offering. Make sure for those who don't throw time, start throwing your time, because if you don't, you are a thief. You're not a thief with the offering, you're a thief with the time. If you don't throw your tithe, you are a thief. And no thief is going to sit on the velvet table. I'll tell you that.
And it's up to you whether you want to pay gross or net. If you want a penny pitch with the Lord, he'll pay you that with you. You know, I heard a story of um, somebody said there was a there was a vision that somebody had in them, and he was walking in heaven. And he saw all these gifts on one side. And he said, What's all these gifts? And he says, Ah, oh, it's for the it's the saints who didn't claim it because they didn't throw their tithe. They can throw it off it. They don't throw nothing. And he's doing this with them, the story under them. So there's certain, say that here in this, there's things that you are supposed to individually get in your life. And you have got it. And you know why? Because God has been holding back. Because it's still holy yours. Don't get me into that. 
because I could spend the five hours talking about constipation. Because I could just look at people and know when they're constipated. <laughs> Now I say who is or who is not. <laughs> anyway, anyway. And there's three ways I can tell you. And I even tell you what the three are. Anyway. And then the Holy Ghost, now he told me, Pastor, he told me, stop having yeast. So then I went back to raw oats, soak it overnight, and I went back to my raw oats. It was good. Yeah. I said, yeah, this feels right. And I've got some apples, they cut some bananas in, got some strawberries in it, mix it all up together. Fantastic. And I went back to cooked oats again. And my system rejected the cooked oats. You know why? Because I realized the molecular structure is changed. So now my system doesn't even want cooked food. It loves life. And let me just let you know this. When you cook food, you kill the enzymes. So it's actually dead. And your body has to get enzymes from itself to make that food what you just eat come alive. And I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you, sis. And I've got a book now that talks about when your enzyme bank is spent, your life technically is as it. So when you eat live food, you're adding to your enzymes. The more good food you eat, is the more you have to use up your body to reserve energy to break it down. And then I realized I was like, the other day, just eat one. When you actually eat live food, you don't need 
you need to digest it in five hours. Because it's got its own enzymes to digest itself. And your stomach actually has a compartment which actually makes it work straight away. When you eat cooked food, your food has to wait for one and a half hours until your body goes to somewhere else to get the enzyme to make that food alive. So technically, when you eat cooked food, your body has to wait one and a half hours before you can do anything with that food. Or that food will sit in you and rot. Has nature made a mistake that we have to do something to make nature work better in the fruit and vegetable kingdom? And then I did a study that you know when you have, when you eat food and the power sources starts to happen in your intestines, your body actually heats up. And technically, when you release the it's 19 hours. Yeah, when you when you release all the goodness inside you. Your body is actually releasing all the lycopene inside you. When you cook in a pot, yes, the lycopene is much more of a potent nature. But where is the lycopene? It's in the pot, in the water, getting distributed throughout all the getting steamed out, cooked out. And I realized that the temperature in your tongue is different from the temperature in your stomach. So when you have lycopene system, the lightning from the tomato is released in your summer and it's got a higher temperature. So what you're saying is right, yes, but you know why you have to soak your oats? Does anybody know why you have to soak your oats? What is you need, what do you need to release? It's pyritic acid, yes. 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 It's pyritic acid, what you have to get rid of in your oats. Pytic, P-Y-T-I-C. Go and study it later on. It's pyritic acid on the country system. It's pyritic acid you have to release from the oats. Now, why are they in the oats? Is it because they don't want us to eat it? No. Because it's just like the nightshade family. You know there's a thing, there's a thing called deadly nightshade as well. Like spinach. It's part of deadly nightshade. You know spinach encourages arthritis. You know your bell peppers, your red, 
and your blue, no, your red, your green, and your yellow. They encourage, they encourage acidosis because the acid levels are too high. They're called deadly nightshade, but then you've got nightshade, which have a, actually nature's put the poison in there to keep it from other animals eating it before humans get it. You see, the animals don't have the wisdom to know what to do to get the pitic acid or the nightshade arsenic out. The arsenic is the poison, nature's natural poison. You know there's poison in nature. Did you know there's poison in nature? And nature has put it there so we know what to do it to get rid of it. So when we eat it, we get the full benefits. So you are right, sister. Yeah, if you eat raw oats, because some people just get raw oats and just eat it raw and it swell up in their system and it gets into their blood, leaky gut syndrome will happen, it starts damaging their brain, eating that whole thing will latch onto your cells in your brain and start to just stay there and just eat it out. But when you release the pitic acid, then you're okay. So raw food is brilliant. And just to let you know, sometimes I can treat myself. Well, I don't know if it's a treat, but so I like a little pumpkin soup. Lentil and pumpkin soup. And I do cook that. But the majority of my food is salad and fruit based. Alright, so that young man over there, did I, are you okay? Did you get soy down? No, the heat has killed it. You got Celsius, you got Fahrenheit. Yeah, anything over 35 and anything over 105 Fahrenheit. Celsius is the bottom one, Fahrenheit is the top one. Anything over 105 is dead. Anything over 35 Celsius is dead. So you can drink the water. You you get a bit of color and a bit of uh, the juices, but that's it really. But if 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 you want to ask a question, drink it. You get the blessing, sister. Just in water, you don't need no special thing, just water. 
No, no sugar, no syrup, no nothing. We should be having white sugar, or brown sugar, or red sugar, or yellow sugar. Sugar feeds cancer. All right? Think sugar damages your, your pancreas. It shoots your feet, it makes your pancreas work too hard, and you shoot your insulin levels up too much. Nobody should be having sugar. It is a poison. And not only that, I realized that I was in a church last week and there's people drinking tea and coffee. Listen, no tea and coffee. I don't mean herbal tea, I mean deadly tea. To the homeless. And no coffee, and I'm in front of this week because someone said to me, Oh, it's okay, you can have a green tea in it. No, green tea ain't good neither. Green tea for caffeine, and it's the number one plant that soaks up with all the lead. You don't want lead inside the system. So no green tea. Yes, it has antioxidants. Yes, it's got this. Yes, it's got that. But let me tell you something. When you drink it, it actually poisons your system. Just like black tea. Oh, you know about no chocolate, innit? I don't need to. Hold on. Do I need to say that to you all? Do I need to say that? No chocolate. You may ask me why, sir. Every chocolate has the five R's in it. And they don't need to tell you. You know, you know, meat's got the four D's. You know meat's got the four D's. Every single meat out there, what you buy is either it died, or it was dying, or it was diseased, or it was disabled. That's the four D's. That's why I encourage every Adventist to not put another morsel of animal flesh inside their stomach. And after the, today's presentation, I don't think you're going to do it anyway. Because we all plan to go to the world and say, well, Amen. 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 Oh, you give it to me eventually. We still love you. All right. Five hours. Whenever they have chocolate and they're making chocolate, the first thing they have to do with chocolate is what? What the first thing they have to do to make chocolate work with the carrot with, with, with the chocolate? They have to make the thing rot. When it rots, when it rots, my sister shaking my head, what is it for you? When when the chocolate, listen to me, when the chocolate rots. When the chocolate rots, they don't need to tell you that, but when the chocolate rots, there is a level of rodent which is allowed to pass over the chocolate because it can't stop it. The chocolate needs to ferment. And when the rat goes over it, there's certain things about rats that I want to tell you about. When they eat, they have their, no, their saliva first of all. So it's first rat saliva. The second, when they eat, their hair always gets missing. Not just their hair, when they eat it, they sweat. Not just their sweat, when they eat it, they don't have a sphincter. You know what a sphincter is? A sphincter is the privilege of you and I have. If nature calls us, we can clench. A rat can't clench. So guess what he do? Where we go, man, just rat droppings. And it's not just with his bowels, and it's with his kidneys as well. So those are the five R's. Saliva, his hair, his sweat, his feces, and his urine. And they allow 10% of rodent activity in a childhood. And I know these, I know that you especially like it at a certain time. But trust me, it's not a food that you should be wanting to make blood out of. Because everything we eat is turned into blood. My sister, are you upset with me? No, no, I'm not upset with you whatsoever. But I think we should just add to this because, yeah, you're, what you're saying about the like, and stuff, and that's true. But with the health message and what
And what you can do with cacao is what many people realise that when you make it in its most natural state, you can actually, it has um, about 50 or 500 different elements. Right, tell me the names. C A C A O. C A C O O. No, C A C A O. C A C A O. Yeah, and if you were to go on the internet like right now and type in raw chocolate, you'd see that you can have raw chocolate cheesecake, all the different things that you like, and it tastes exactly the same. And it's not part of the poison, it's family of poisons. Hold on, hold on. I'm asking the question is it part of the family of family of poisons? No. Like caffeine? Okay, C A C A O. That's the first time I've heard of that. Well done, my sister. And for those who uh, agree with you as well, young man. Huh? Sugar cane is good. That's natural. That's that's cool. Sugar cane is natural, but it has to come from the sugar cane. Yeah, that's come from the sugar cane. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Well done. Well done. I know carrot. I know the carrot pot. That's John the Baptist food. I know the carrot pot. But the C A C A O, I want to check that one out. C A twins. C A C A O. Alright. Sister Jenny said I have to finish at quarter past eight. So I've got an hour. So I'm going to do this quick study with you. I don't want to leave here because I never know if I'm going to see a face again. And I've learned to love a lot of you now. And trust me, and even if we disagree, we can disagree to agree. Amen? And we're going to study to make sure we approve a watchman or workman unto God that need is not to be ashamed. Now, how holy is the Sabbath? How holy? All right now. Now, every time we used to do campaigns around the world, a lot of people used to say to me, Oh, evangelist, is it okay for me to be in my hospital with my wife on the Sabbath? And I used to say, like, you know, no. I said, it's our own work. And I never used to be able to deal with it properly. But now I want to deal with it properly. Yes? Because there are a lot of people who don't know how holy the Sabbath is. I'm to show you how holy the Sabbath is. The first ten, so I'm going to go through it quick because Sister Jenny. Genesis 1 26. Genesis 1 26. Now I'm going to read them, yeah, just in case, just for the sake of time. Genesis chapter 1, reading verse 26, yes? Now, what's the first text I'm going to say? How holy is the Sabbath? Is it okay for me to be with my wife on the Sabbath? And a one of people argue with me and you start arguing and not arguing with me no more. Genesis 1 26. Oh, and God said, let us make man in our image and after our lives, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the pattern of all the earth and over every creeping thing that creep on earth. So God created man in his own image. The image of God created him, male and female created he them. So God made male and female. Amen? Amen. Good. Verse 28. And God blessed them. What was that blessing? What was that blessing? That blessing was God married Adam and Eve when? What day was that? 
The sixth day, what day is the sixth day? Friday. So Adam and Eve got married on a Friday before sunset. So the origins of marriage is from who? God. Hebrews 13 verse 4. Hebrews 13 verse 4. The Apostle Paul talks about like this in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13 read verse 4. Hebrews 13. The reason why I say these things is I don't want none of you to copy me now and start getting to it properly. Hebrews chapter 13 read verse 4. That's in the New Testament for those who don't know. Marriage is honorable in all. Marriage is honorable in all areas. Whether it's in the kitchen, whether it's in the bedroom, whether it's when you talk to one another, it's the way when you treat one another. Marriage is honorable. What does honorable mean? Exalted. Marriage is honorable in all areas. Don't think that just because you're married, you can do anything what you want. Because little do you know, even when you're married, there's angels watching your protection. And don't feel like an animal in front of all the angels. <laughs> Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled. Oh. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge them. So technically speaking, if you were in a bed and she's not your wife or he's not your husband, God's going to judge you because you're doing something you should not be doing with that person. That person is a stranger. First Samuel, first Samuel, first Samuel 21, verse 3. First Samuel chapter 21. First Samuel chapter 21, reading verse 3. First Samuel chapter 21, reading verse 3. First Samuel, Samuel is after Judges. Judges, Joshua, Joshua, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Numbers, Leviticus, Exodus after that, before that I mean, and then Genesis. So Sir Samuel chapter 21, write it down, and when you go home, check me out for yourself. Oh, the Bible says it is First Samuel 21. Now what happened is that David was running from Saul. And David was hungry with his men because Saul wanted to kill him. So David went to the high priest and said, listen, high priest, we're hungry. And we need to eat some food. And the high priest said, listen, the only food I've got is the shoe bread with no yeast. And it's holy. Listen to what happens now. Now, therefore, what is under thy hand? Verse 3. Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. That means the showbread present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread, if the young men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth, Women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are what? The vessels of the young men are holy. So long then, if David had been with his wives, what would have happened? He would have been? What would have been? He would have been in a holy state. Even though he never sinned. But there's something I want to try and bring to you, Lord, that the Lord is starting to expose to God's people who are serious about the third dimension. Listen. Oh, the vessel of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common here, though it was sanctified this day in the vessel. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, and there was no bread there but the show bread. So technically, David was holy enough to be able to partake of the show bread. Okay, we understand that, yes? Exodus 19, 15. Exodus chapter 19, verse 15. We all know where Exodus is. Exodus chapter 19, but reading verse 15, the children of Israel was about to get the Ten Commandments from the living God. But let me tell you something. God had to tell them something to let them know, listen, you might think you know holiness, but when I come down, there's a different type of holiness going on when I'm around. Because when I am anywhere it is holy ground, Moses had to take off his shoes, the children of Israel had to do something. Listen. And it says here in Exodus chapter 19, verse 15. 
Um, verse 40, rather. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. That means you must come to church with dirty clothes, neither. All right, hold on right there. And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day and come not at your wives. When Sabbath don't sister, you don't even keep the Sabbath. No, no, no. Some people are saying, what, what are you trying to say? It's wrong for me to be with my wife? No, it's not wrong for you to be with my wife. God gave you six days to do that. She that is married, care for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Listen to verse 35 now. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. And this I speak for your own profit. Listen. Not that I may cast the smear upon you. Because some people are saying, no, you're wrong, Paul. He's saying, this is a smear. Listen. But for that which 
which is comely, and that you may attend upon the Lord without distraction. What do you mean to tell me that? So you mean to tell me marriage actually can distract me from doing the work of the Lord? Yes. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying marriage is a bad thing because I'm married. But I'm saying that to even this. You've got six days to enjoy your wife or to enjoy your husband. But you see the seven? You're coming to meet the living God. And when you come to these courts, you are supposed to be in a holy state. And sometimes I hear something preach, oh, was it my wife last night? I heard it. I just saw it. I heard it. He said, oh, was it my wife last night? And still think about it. And he was preaching on the pulpit. I was with his wife Friday night last night. Someone should just grab it and say, Sit up, man. <laughs> sit up. Don't even sit down. Sit down. How about you saying those things in the pulpit? You still think about it. You should be preaching to the people. We should all know that. That one comes home to us like a rocket. Isaiah chapter 58. So when you sleep with your wife, when your wife sleeps with you, both you are unclean until the evening. And there's nothing wrong with it. You are privileged if you're married to enjoy your wife or your husband. But when it comes to holy time, and you're coming to meet God on the Sabbath, be careful how you present yourself before the Lord. Because God, when you see in Isaiah, he is holy. Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah chapter 58. You know why? Because we need to repair the breach. Isaiah chapter 58, the Bible says, oh, read verse 13. Isaiah chapter 58, read verse 13. You know Isaiah chapter 58 is all about fasting. You need to read Isaiah chapter 58 because those who are sick, those who have cancer, those who have diabetes, blood pressure, certain types of sickness, you know what you need to do? You need to go to fast. And some people say, no, no, we're going to die because we can't food. Well, you know, you need to stop eating the back food and fast some good food. If thou turn away thy foot, verse 13, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, whose day is the Sabbath? Us? You have this church? It's God. And call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thy own ways. See, you can't go anywhere on the Sabbath. Neither thy own pleasure. You can't do, not just go anywhere, you can't do anything what you want on the Sabbath. You can't do your pleasure. And you can't speak thy own words. Because the Sabbath is a holy day. And every time I go around the world now, I preach it because there's only one characteristic of what Sister White says. When the latter rain starts to fall, God's people are going to start to keep the Sabbath more fully. We're not keeping the Sabbath right now. We're not keeping the Sabbath. We're not keeping the Sabbath the way God really wants us to keep it. Some of us are going shopping. Some of us are talking anything. Some of us are dressing anyhow. Some of us think that the Sabbath is only divine hour. Some of us don't even think Sabbath is Friday night and you still watch your television. The Bible says from sunset to sunset, we must celebrate our Sabbath. You must open the Sabbath and you must close it. We don't keep the Sabbath properly. We, we, we too wishy-washy. And some of us are still worrying about rushing to go home. Spend the whole day in church. Because there will come a time when you're going to wish you had more Sabbaths. And let me tell you something as well. There's people in the grave who may plan to be there now, but they're there. And let me tell you something. I'll come to my sister. They wish they could come back for one Sabbath and worship God. There's people in the grave now who died last year who thought that they've got many years ahead of them. You know what they have not got many years ahead and you're bitching those people that they're going to come back for one Sabbath. You think they'll be like us? You think they'll be like us? I've got a message for them. They're dead and sweet to us. As 
some people come from the grave and tell you how it feels to be in the grave, waiting for the judgment. They tell you something. They want to tell you something nice. And they want to be talking about the partial resurrection. Nina, my sister. church and close the Sabbath together. That's what I believe. We as God's people, we're too black, we're too slapdash. We're too slapdash. You know, you know what slapdash means? That means that we just don't really care too much. The angels care. You understand? We need to be careful how we worship God, not just in the way we dress. Some of, us, some of our dressing is, 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 But then you come to God anyhow. And music! I don't want to get myself in trouble for my life. This is the journey. Alright, alright. I'm going to go into my presentation. I won't be able to finish all of it. But it is in this book called A Sin of Ignorance, alright? So I'm going to give you a little taste of and I'm going to skip a few things, alright? Because Jenny is saying that I need to finish. In 45 minutes. Now, this presentation technically lasts three hours, if I'm not mind sharp. So, I hope you enjoyed that question time. Did it help you at all? All heaven was represented to me as beholding and watching upon the Sabbath those who acknowledge the claims of the fourth commandment are observing the Sabbath. Angels were marking their interest in and high regard for this divine institution. The Sabbath is a delight. These the angels were specially blessing with light and health and special strength was given unto them. Those who, are sancti those who sanctify the Lord in their hearts by a strictly devotional frame of mind and who sought to improve the sacred hours in keeping the Sabbath to the best of their ability and to the honor, to the honor of God by calling the Sabbath a delight. These are angels specially blessed. So when you call the Sabbath a delight, you get special bliss. When you can't wait the Sabbath to done, the angels know about it. You know every one of us has a body in it. I know where I am. No. Okay, well I've done those things, I've done those. I'm going to try and do my best to make you understand the gist of the sin of ignorance. What is sin? Well, version 3, 4, sin is a transgression of the law. Uh, break of choice in page 492 is impossible to explain the origin of sin as to give a reason for its existence. Oh, touch my tongue, Jesus. I pray you would help me to say enough in this 45 minutes that the saints of God will be truly blessed and filled so they can last and throughout the whole week the residents of heaven resting upon them. In Jesus' name, let everybody say, Amen. Nothing is more plain to in scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin. That there was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace, no deficiency in the divine government, 
that day of occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Citizen intruder, for whose presence no reason can be given, he is mysterious, unaccountable, to excuse it is defended. When excuse for it be found, or cause be shown for his existence, it will cease to be sin. Our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God, and it is the transgression of the law. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of God's divine government. There are five years of sin. Sir, I'm going fast because I want to get to the point where I want to get to. There's five areas. There's four levels of sin. There's two types of sin. There needs to be an understanding of sin, and it needs to, there is a power of sin, and there is a presence of sin. The first one, there's four levels of sin. There's transgression, sin, and iniquity. Does everybody understand that? Oh, please, saints, tell me you do. Yeah. All right, transgression is when you don't even know that it's sin. Sin is when you didn't mean it and you just slipped up and said, oh, Lord, forgive me, I didn't plan it, you lost your temper. But iniquity is when you make up your mind and say, Lord, I don't care, do good, now do it. Because you know what? I know you're going to forgive me. And in Psalm 51, 1 and 2, in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it talks about those three types of sin. But David said, listen, don't let iniquity have dominion over me. That means controlling us. Now, some of us have iniquity controlling us. What do you mean by that, sir? We're doing things we know is wrong, but we can't stop doing it. But there's another one, abomination. Idolatry is abomination. Unclean foods, homosexuality is abomination. Proud, lying heart, Roman Catholic system on earth, that is an abomination. No. Anyway. Two types of sin. Omission. We mean omission. We have not done what God has called us to do. Commission. We have done what God has called us not to do. So technically sometimes you say, oh Lord, I haven't done this, I haven't done that, but God said you're supposed to do it. And we say, no, 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 Lord, I don't want to do it. But God says, you know what, it's a sin of omission. Three, there's understanding or two sides of sin. Let's look at adultery. There's a letter. Thou shalt not commit adultery physically. Now if I was walking down the street, <laughs> and I see a lovely woman, and I look at my wife, and I look at her and I say, Come on, wife, slap her out there and say, listen, you know what, she's not looking out there, but I'm going to divorce you. Can my wife hit me in my head and say, you know what, you see, I'm going to divorce you. Can she? <laughs> you have a great dream. My wife, I cannot divorce me just because I look on a woman. But have I sinned? Yes. Who would I sin against? God. God. Why? Because I lusted after another woman. I shouldn't even be lusting after my wife. But I lusted after another woman. But now, hold on now. Imagine this woman who I saw, I see her again, I'm not with my wife. And I said, hey. Little sweet thing, you. And before you know it, we exchange numbers. Before you know it, we go and drink a coffee together. And my head full of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and before you know it, I'm naked before the holy angels. Have I sinned? And my wife divorced me. Yes. So you need to understand sin. Does sin of itself have power? I would love to go through the text, but I can't. Does sin of itself have power? If sin had power, it will go after you in anything. So where does sin go after? Your weakness. Sin is a coward. Did sin get any victories over Jesus? No. Does sin need to get any victory over you, Sister Yvonne? No. And anybody allows sin to get a victory over them? You sin. Sin is a coward. Sin is weak. Sin don't have no power. But you know what it does? It latches onto your weak points just like cancer. And I tell women that you know five words, you always say, you know you can have five words. But five points always settle in your weakest organ of the body. You know why? Because it's the area of least resistance. Is there a 
presence of sin. Listen now, when I come down the M1 or the M40, I said, one is Sodom and the other one is Gomorrah. Because every time I go down to the end of the M1 or the end of the M40, it's a different presence. I'm in London now, I can feel the warfare. That's why I live in commentary. Because the warfare is so much more intense. In London, I don't know how you're spiritual, you're not good. If you're living where I live, you'll be your high side. I know that I, my warfare will be ten times harder me living in London. City living is no good. Amen. And Locke had that problem and it was his wife who drove him into Saddam. And his wife wanted to stay there. That's why the angel had to say, Lock quick! Sin has a presence. And trust me, sitting in there is not the best if you want to grow spiritually. It's not the best. Now, I'm not telling you to leave London now, but you shall have a five year plan to get out of London. Because when problems start, we, and not the staff, in London, it's so hard to get off. The last thing I want to do is live off Tesco and add to the same things. It's your check, you want to buy food, you're eating. Second point, sin and the sanctuary. Very fast, but I need to finish half an hour. When we sin and we ask for forgiveness, where does our sin go? Brethren, love me, brethren. Some people believe in Micah chapter 7, verse 18 to 19, where they say that all our sin falls in the bottom of the sea. That is just a metaphor. God don't put sin in the bottom of the sea. Alright? The only reason why it says that is because there's certain parts of the sea where the bottom, they can't find it. Because there's certain things if you did as a church member and you sin, like if me, if me committed adultery, you sitting in the front of the messenger with the messenger. If I commit adultery, I'll be in the front of the messenger. Not to say literally, but I'm saying that to mean this, everybody will know about it. So God said he put the sins at the bottom of the sea so none of your church members can find out about it. But when we sin, where does our sins go? Sin cannot be forgotten about. Something or someone has to pay for sin. The law requires not just blood, but the life of the individual. The Bible says, he that covereth his sins shall not, what church? Prosper. But whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have, what? Mercy. The important truths concerning atonement were taught the people by this yearly service. In the sin offerings presented during the year, a substitute has been accepted in a sinner's stead. But the blood of the victim had not made full atonement for the sin. It, only, it had only provided a means by which the sin was transferred to the sanctuary. By the offering of blood, the sinner acknowledged the authority of the law, confessed the guilt of his transgression, and expressed his faith in him who was to take away the sin of the world. But he was not entirely released from the condemnation of the law. That's what I want to tell you as well tonight. First point. When you sin, your sin is not forgotten about. When you sin, it is transferred from you into the heavenly sanctuary. And it is there waiting. Waiting for what? It's waiting to see if you complete your atonement. Because if you don't complete your atonement, guess who's going to pay for that sin which is being transferred to the sanctuary? What, you think Jesus is going to pay for it? It's coming right back upon your head if you don't make it. Because if you don't make it, you're going to burn for your own sins. And I heard that if Adventists are lost, they're going to burn me not as long as Satan. So yes, you might say, oh, Jesus will forgive me of my sins. He will. But be careful, because when you sin, it's not forgotten about. All what Jesus has done has taken the sin from you, so you don't have to die today. 
of that sin and it's transferred in the sanctuary and stays there to see if you get the victory over sin. And if you don't get the victory over sin, sin has to be paid for. So where are sins? They are in the heavenly sanctuary because you confess them to Satan them. So who is in the heavenly sanctuary? Well, we know Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary, so I don't need to go into that. Third point, sin and the judgment. We know that Jesus is in the sanctuary, yes? Everybody knows that, yes? Okay, good. Sin and the judgment. What is the purpose of the judgment and when did it start? At the time appointed for the judgment, the close of the 2300 days in 1844, began the work of investigation and blotting out of sins. All who have ever taken upon themselves the name of Christ must pass in search and scrutiny. Both the living and the dead are to be judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Let me tell you something if you do not know it. Since 1844, Jesus has been judging the righteous dead and nobody knows when he's going to be, going to be passed on to the righteous dead. But let me tell you something. Jesus could have come if the church had sent the 1888 message. So I believe that Jesus has been finished judging the righteous dead long time ago. And I believe he's not even doing nothing more now than watching us. The fear of the I don't think he's judging the righteous dead because Sister White said God had to withhold the latter rain because the church rejected the 1888 message. So in 1844, Jesus started the judgment in heaven and started removing the sins of the saints and plotting them out. And then, on the day of atonement, the high priest had been taken off for the congregation, went into the most holy place of the blood and spirit of the mercy upon the tables of the law. Thus the claims of the law which were demanding the life of the sinner were satisfied. Someone's name could be called tonight. This could be someone's last Sabbath. And every time I do campaigns on a major level, Someone always dead. Because you know what God hates? He doesn't mind when you're in darkness and when he gives you the truth, you live up to it. You know what God dislikes? It's when he gives you the truth and you look at the truth and say, you know what? I don't want to live up to it. Jesus said, this is the condemnation of John chapter 3. That light has come and you reject it because you love darkness. Or is it an antitype? We know all about that. We know all about that. Did you know that there are things we can do on earth that would help our atonement to be achieved in the second sanctuary? What are you talking about, sir? I call them sanctuary benefits. These are just a few I found, but I'm sure there is more. Sanctuary benefits. Write down these text and check me out for yourself. Psalm chapter 56. Verse 8. Oh, I'm going to read this quick. Psalm chapter 56, reading verse 8. Let's tell you. Psalm chapter 56, reading verse 8. Psalm 56, reading verse 8. Look what the Bible says, my brothers and sisters. Psalm chapter 56, verse 8. Thou test my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? What are you talking about, preacher? That means that when you go through a trial, my God looks at that trial and is a little bit more merciful to you when you go off course because he knows that you're going through a hard time. And when they're written in the book and your tears are written in the book, my God will show a little bit more mercy to you in the judgment over that issue at that time. Okay, Psalm 87, reading verse 4 to 6. Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter 87, reading verse 4 to 6. Psalm chapter 87, reading verse 4 to 6. Listen, I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to them that know me. Behold, Philistia and Tyre and Ethiopia, this man was born there. And of Zion it shall be said, this and that man was born in her. And the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writeth up the people that this Man was born there. What? In other words, in the heavenly sanctuary, going on now the judgment, 
My God will look at how you were born, what family you were born in, what era of the world you were born in, what privileges you had to understand the truth. And my God will be extra merciful for those who have been grown up in an environment which was not very good for Christian growth. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Oh, I like this one. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. I like this one. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. And the Bible says, Then they that fear the Lord, they spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened and he heard it, praise God. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that fear the Lord and have thought upon his name right now. Because we're standing, we're spending a little bit more longer in church. My God's going to put against your name that you was in church this Sabbath, hearing the message, and he's going to give you an extra blessing. You don't get excited over truth as much as me. James chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. James chapter 5, verse 19 to 20. James, after the book of Hebrews. James chapter 5, the brother Jesus. James chapter 5, reading verse 19 to 20. This is my brothers and sisters. James chapter 5, reading verse 19 to 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one converts him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. What? So you know when you are used by the Lord to bless someone, help someone to get back in harmony with God, my God will say, you know what? There's a few things you can buy that are but since you work so well for me, I'm going to hide you so those sins don't fall upon your head in judgment. One more in first Peter chapter 4, me verse 8. First Peter chapter 4, me verse 8. I love my Bible. First Peter chapter 4, me verse 8. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know what charity is in the Bible? Love. The more love you have amongst the brethren in the church, my God said he will show a little more mercy to the multitude of the sins. Sanctuary benefits. So you know what's going on in heaven now? It's the judgment. You know what's going on in heaven now? Someone's name could be called right now in heaven. And if we exercise all those five divine attributes or gifts, my God said your atonement will become more easier. But if we come into church and we're all stiff naked and we're dry naked and we're cold and we're miserable and we're just carrying and we're fighting against all the truth, let me tell you something, judgment would arrive swift to some people. Conscience at your tongue. Oh. If the sanctuary is to be cleansed, where must the cleansing start from or first? Huh? Who proves the sanctuary? I'm talking about going to get to work with him, but who pollutes the sanctuary? Jesus? Who pollutes the sanctuary? Jeremiah chapter 17, with Jer- Jer- Tom, Jesus. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altar. Guess who, guess where sin is registered? It's registered in two places. It's not just registered in the heavenly sanctuary. It's registered in the mind. When you sin, you know it. And when you sin, it's in your memory. Oh no. Is there ways we can go back into our memory? Things on the 
inside of a television, and sometimes we go to bed, we replay those things in our memory. And it gets so bad, my brothers and my sisters, we watch some things so much that those things end up in our marriage. Sin is registered in two places. It's in our memory, and it's in the heavenly sanctuary. So we just don't have to cleanse them. It's not the heavenly sanctuary, but my God, you can cleanse them any time. You know what we have to cleanse? Your memory. So when I talk to you about this morning, you say, you never cut out soul brother and cut out music. I'm not saying it because I have nothing to say. I'm saying it because if you don't and you keep on downloading information, you give giving the Holy Ghost even a harder job to do to try and save you. The Holy Ghost is divided the way to the Holy Souls of the Amen, yet made masses, while the first tabernacle we are standing, which is a thing of the time and present, which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that could not make him that little service perfect as the gift to the country. My God is not interested in just forgiving us now. My God is interested in seeing who can be willing to live a perfect life and finish your work. God's been forgiven for years. Thousands of years. He's been forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. It's about time my God can get someone who he can trust. And he's going to get there. He's going to get a hundred and forty four thousand. But don't think that you can, you can make God put trust in you when you're eating things you shouldn't be eating. Because if you eat anything from the animal, you will take on the characteristics of the animal. And I'm going to get to it before I try step off this place here. Ooh. Why can't God give with the sins of the lost and the ungodly after a thousand years? Why, 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 why can't God judge the righteous now? Why can't he judge the wicked? Well, there's a thing called accountability and influence. What? Well, if a lady dressed in a certain way and she causes 500 men throughout the day to sin, then she was accountable for dressing that way, which caused them to lust after her. So she was accountable 500 times to cause those men to lust. So she sinned 500 times for that accountability. So they give her a dress, not just in a weekday, but especially at church. Or if a parent wrongly trains a child to be a thief, then the child is not just guilty, but also a parent is guilty for influencing and training the child to be a thief. That's why God's last day people have a message to give. This is again his message, you know that. That we need to preach that the hour of his judgment is come. We are not like Sunday worshippers. We are the instrument what God uses to warn the world that the judgment has now come. Now, if we are to warn the world, we are supposed to be living like the judgment has come in our life as well. And that's my problem. My problem is that we are not much different. And we need to be different hmm. because we are the real now. Amen. And me now broke up with no other denomination. I'm a seventh day Adventist to the day of job day. I spoke to a young lady and I said, listen, I can go anywhere and I'm going to your church and I'll preach about the Sabbath and why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. You really need to come to my church and tell me why your church on Sunday? She said, no. You know why? Because she knows she doesn't have a message. And you should be proud of the message what we have been given by God. And it's a shame that we don't even know it. Anyway, the ignorance of sin. What is ignorance? Well, lack of knowledge, information, or education. Unaware, unconscious, unenlightened, inexperienced, unintelligent, innocent, uninformed, unknowing, unlearned. That is a true definition of ignorance. That means you never, you never know. That means you never have a chance to know. Why? Because Paul stood upon Mars Hill and encouraged the believing Gentiles that they must turn from their idols and devotion to worship service and serve the living God in whom we live and move and have our being. And he said, at this time of ignorance, God will do our church. Because it would get out of no, no better. And God said, you know what? I'll wink at you. And what does it say now? Because they never had a chance to know. And at the time of this ignorance, this ignorance, this type of ignorance, God winked at but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. But there's another type of ignorance. 
Hosea was called upon to be a prophet of mourning because Israel had rebellious for Israel. Uh, prophet of mourning because Israel had been rebellious and had forsaken the Lord God and rejected the warnings from the prophets, even killing them. And they committed whoredoms in the land of my swearing and lying, killing, stealing, committing adultery. And God declared he had a controversy with his inhabitants because there is no truth, no mercy, no knowledge of God in the land. Therefore, the land shall mourn and the people shall languish. Many languish. That means they come sick. Weak, abandoned, and sorrow. If you look at us, there's not much of that. More than too much of us are sick. Here's what he says My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Hmm. Because what have we done? Get. I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no more priest. You see, thou hast the law of thy God. I will also forget the church. Since you're so passionate about your children, I'm going to forget you and your children. Many will be lost for the simple fact that they were spiritually careless and they did not seek God also. They did not seek the truth of God and they, they did not seek his truth and God makes it clear he does not weep at this type of stiff naked ignorance because it's based on his days when it's coupled with rejection. God does not weep at some of the Adventists. He frowns. Due to the congregation, what is due to the congregation? Oh, I can't go through this now, I can't go through this now, I can't go through this. All right, there's a duty of the congregation. When the children of Israel were there, were told for one day, one day, just one day out of the whole year, the sanctuary was going to be cleansed. And these are the five things they need to do. They need to afflict their souls. They need to do no work. They need to change their clothes. They need to fast. And they need to rise early. The high priest, he couldn't even go to sleep. You know why? Because if he went to sleep, his wife might have went beside him and he might have slept with her. And if he sleep with her, he'd be on clean or two ways, sister. But to the evening, if he didn't go in the sanctuary, in the sanctuary, day of atonement, I'll be slept with his wife. Can't stop. You know what? You know what? Yeah, yeah, it's a scream. And then you know they stop hearing the bells. <laughs> because it's better for the raw presence of the living God. Hmm. He couldn't go to sleep because he might have had a funny dream, and he couldn't go to sleep because his wife might have just molested him in the night and he never know about it. So the high priest had to stay up all night. <laughs> Jesus never sleeping, and he ever lived to make intercession for God's people. Well, my brothers and my sisters, the Bible says that we must afflict our souls. The affliction of the saints. Are we afflicting our souls? There's three main areas that we need to afflict our souls as seventh day Adventists. We need to do no work. That means that our life is supposed to be ministry and mission driven. And I'm not saying you're not supposed to have a 9 to 5 job. I'm not saying you're not supposed to have a career. I'm saying that if you don't have a ministry which you are supporting or you're doing yourself, you are a dead Christian. And you now take back the town of I'm saying if you don't have a ministry, where you are supporting somebody who's doing the work, or if you're not doing the work, you have a dead Christianity. And tonight, before sunset, you should be making some adjustments in your life so God can start working in your life. Like me and Raymond, my brethren there, we're going to be starting, we're going to ministry, we're going to go around and doing campaigns. We've got a program in Africa, a program by Zambia in March. The young men should be out and about preaching. The women should be out and about preaching and teaching. Because when Jesus comes, you can't give him education. When Jesus comes, the only thing he wants is a character. You pray for the Lord to give you something what you're passionate about so you can work for. Two, you must change the clothes. Our clothing is supposed to reflect that we are not of the world. And the way many of us dress, we are on the side of the enemy of God. The way you dress many of us, you can see that you have a relation, you don't have a relationship with the Lord. You don't have it. Because there's no way the Holy Ghost is going to dress you with those clothes. 
There's no way. And I'll go even this far. Some of us are dressed by a fallen angel today. Because God never dressed you. Because God does not show those type of limbs. And I'm not a dress reformer, I'm a health reformer. But you muck about with me, I step into the dress reform area because you know what? There's so many of my brethren. I thank God they was not good by it. But there's so much of my brethren who wanted to preach the message, but they could not do it because a woman shut up in locks. And all they need to do is step at the back of the church and say, Amen. You know why? Because she mutilated it with her body. And both of them was to blame, yes. But we need to strengthen one another. And I had a warning from one girl yesterday. She's telling me, Evangelist, the way you preach, I know Satan has his eyes upon you. And I said, Sister, you think I'm going to give up my crown of flesh? That's why I don't want to live in the cities. And I, I soon I'm out growing commentary for Sister Jane. I want to live in Jamaica upon the mountains. We need to fast. We as those people should be on a continual fast. We must all get back to eating and diet because that's the diet of the work container. I want to sit on the work container. I don't know about you, but listen to what Sister White says. No, no one should be set apart as a teacher of the people while his or her own teaching or example contradicts the testimony of God. What's the, what's the testimony of God? The spirit of prophecy. For this will bring confusion, disregard of health reform. Fits one to stand as the Lord's messenger. If you think you can stand up here and flush anything down your system and say, oh, the Lord bless it, it's okay, you're wrong. If you go against the spirit of prophecy, my God does not even recognize you as an instrument of his, and you are not fit to preach the gospel of Jesus. I know you don't like it, but it's all right. Greater reform should be seen among the people who claim to be looking for the soon appearing of Christ. Health reform is to do among our people a work which it has not yet done. There are those who ought to be awake to the danger of meat eating. What is it? What is it? It's a danger. Who are still eating the flesh of animals, thus endangering the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. Many who are now only half converted on the question of meat eating will go from God's people to walk no more with them. Not they're sitting in the church, but you won't be growing spiritually. Health reform is the lifeblood of the saints. The primary purpose of health reform is not physical but spiritual. Some people say, I don't eat raw food, so I can walk around and say, no, I have a raw food man, I have healthy. No, 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 no. I am eating the way I eat, not for my physical well-being, that's a byproduct. I eat and drink the way I eat and drink so I can hear the Holy Ghost speaking to me. Amen. Amen. The stomach is closely related to the brain. And when the stomach is diseased, the nerve power is caught from the brain to the aid of the weak and digestive organs. When these demands are too frequent, the brain becomes congested. And I say that some of us are not just mentally, we're spiritually constipated. I will give three reasons why as we as God's last day people should not eat meat. I'm going to try to get through it. I don't know how I'm going to do it, Jenny. Not just because it is dangerous, but because it causes our atonement in heaven more difficult to be achieved. Genesis chapter 9, verse 1 to 5. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the field of you and the earth shall be upon all flesh. I'm going to go down to verse 4 now. But flesh to the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. And surely, verse 5, and surely your blood of your life shall I require. At the hand of every. What? 
every time you have an animal in your place, my God puts it against your name. And you're going to have to be accountable for that animal that you ate. He's not just going to require blood of your life. You know what that means? That means he's going to take life force from your blood. That means you're going to become weakened or you're going to become sick. But my God said he counts every time you have an animal, he counts it against your name. And you're going to have to tell him why you eat it. Second thing, things and things. There's so much things have kidneys. I want you to go into sin creams. Tomatoes. Cancer, cow leukemia. You know how much cows have leukemia, cancer of the blood? You know 98% of meat is unclean? Only 2%. They say that this thing called horse, fox, and donkey. You know this horse issue? When they have so much horse, he was in Tesla's or in these supermarkets. They said that you won't be able to know where your meat comes from for the next five years. Because the European government has opened up all the borders of Europe, and that meat has traveled to about seven countries. Rat meat. You know they arrested 91 Chinese men for getting ready to send rat meat to different parts of the world. Grow hormones. You want to know why these young girls are just with everything? Casein and prions. When you have animal protein, you are actually altering your own DNA. And GM and meat glue, genetically modified food, but meat glue, not meat glue is. They get poor platelets. You know the platelets in your blood, which actually get your blood to clot. So when you cut yourself, your blood clots. When they get the pigs platelets, what causes his blood to clot, and they add it to the meat, and they make bits and pieces all together with the pig's blood, and they call it now as one lean piece of meat. So when you go and keep buying one lean piece of meat, you're not. You're buying a whole heap of pig platelet with bits and pieces of other animals, which if you could see it in its natural state, you wouldn't eat it. We don't know what we are eating. And if we look at these eight areas, we can clearly see if we eat meat, we really cannot know what we are eating. It's not just guesswork, but it's plain physical and spiritual suicide we are committing. And there is also another major problem facing meat eating. Fat blood, fat in our atonement. What? Genesis 4, Genesis, the list of the and Acts. And Abel, he also brought the first and the flock. Woo. Of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. What did Abel give you to his children? What did Abel bring to the Lord? Fat. Why did he bring blood? Because Abel never ate meat. You were only allowed to eat meat after the flood. This is before the flood. So the only thing he was bringing was the animal slain and it's fat. Why fat? Fat is a symbolism of sin. Listen, verse 4. But flesh and the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall we not eat. Who did God tell this to Genesis chapter 9? To who? He told Noah, flesh of the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Now, I have to ask the question, was Noah a Jew? No word, no Jew. He just, he was a man of God who followed the word of God. And verse 25 says, fat! You mustn't eat nothing with fat! That's why no seventh guy went to down in Kentucky. Because all you're eating is unclean meat full of fat and blood. Look, more we shall eat no manner of blood. The fat and the blood is forbidden in the Bible. And God said in red, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood. And I will cut him out from among his people. Now, do you want God's face to be against you? Ask your question. Do you want God's face to be against you? That's Old Testament preacher. When you go in the New Testament, all right, it's New Testament we are. For you see, good for the Holy Ghost into us and help, but we know great to burn that be necessary things. That you're saved from meat, of blood, and idols, halal meat. And from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. Even in the New Testament. Now, where did these guys you know come from? Moral of the statue of the ceremony. In closing. Where do these laws come from about the blood and the fat? Is it being done away with Jesus on the cross? Malachi 4, 4, so remember you the law of Moses, my son, which I command unto him in our all Israel, with the statutes and the... The statutes. 613 of them. What deals with how 
how we are supposed to study. And you say, never ever kill a mother and her daughter at the same time. Talk about an animal. Never have meat and milk at the same time. Because it causes mucus in your stomach. Why is it now become okay to have blood back when we eat our meat? And it's the blood that sweetens the meat. Why is it okay now? Where has God changed? Where has God said, okay, it's okay now? You can have the blood of the battle. Why not God? Why not the Jews? Why not the first century Christians? You have been this now. You can have the blood of the battle. It's okay. Where do you find that? So why are we doing it? Sister White tells us that Satan had a meeting. And I could go to him. I like to respect Jenny and Jenny's house and just walk out. Satan had a meeting. And Satan said, if I can get God's people on appetite, he said, I don't care if it's not the truth. That's not big thing to me. What's big to me is making sure that their appetite, or their appetite don't come into harm with God. And he's got us. How's your appetite? You want to eat meat, it has to be kosher. And it is a sin to go to a regular butchers and buy that meat because it was prepared unclean. Sister White says, a positive injury is done to the system by continuous meat eating. There is no excuse for it or meat eating but a depraved and perverted appetite. And we'll get to the point where we'll look at a butcher's shop with disgust. How's your appetite? Is it depraved and perverted? You think I would like the prophet to speak to me about my appetite like that? Church of the Lord. Fix on. But if you don't, this will affect. What about fish? Oh, my sister asked about fish. Oh, my sister asked about fish. From the life God has given me, the prevalence of cancer and tumors is largely due to gross living on dead flesh. In many places, fish become so contaminated by the filth on which they feed as to be a cause of disease. This is especially the case when the fish come in contact with the sewage of large cities. London! The fish that are fed on contents of the drains, which is feces. And they pass into distant waters and they be caught where the water is pure and fresh. Thus, when users food, they bring disease and death on those who do not suspect the danger. You go to the doctor, you don't know what in the gut this disease. The doctor don't know neither. But you know who knows? The fish.
the wonderful things that God has shown me on heaven. I can't describe. I saw their tables of stone in which the names of the 144,000 were engraved in letters of gold. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and went into the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done my will, suffer for me. Come into supper, for I myself will serve you. We shouted, Hallelujah, glory, and entered. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the fruit of the tree of life, the manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. Then Jesus said, you must go back to earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. Sometimes I think I can stay here no longer. All things on earth are so dreary. I feel very alone here, for I have seen a better land. Thank you very much for the such a song. Okay, so we're going to bring our A Y program to a close, and I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we close the prayer. Okay, let's kneel. Okay. Dear gracious. 